praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are celebrating as we are preparing to enter into the season of celebrating the Lord Jesus. And I'm excited about his birth and what it means, his birth means to our lives. Thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. I'm always excited about that. I'm going to be ministering today. I know I've been out of the pulpit for a few weeks, but I am ministering today on this Youth Day about the generation of a warning that God gives to our young people. And I believe the principle applies not only to young people, but it also applies to those who have violated it in their youth and are bearing the consequences today in their adulthood. We're going to give you some solutions and answers of what Christ wants you to do. Thank you for joining us. Have a blessed and marvelous day. Almighty God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we humble ourselves before you and we come before you to give you first of all praise that's due to your name. We know you're a miracle working God, a problem solving God, a promise keeping God. And we bless you for what you've already done. As we come before you today, we come God praying and interceding that your will would be done in the life of the person whose hand we hold, whose name we call out. We call out their name before your throne, cast their name at your feet and ask you to work a miracle on their behalf and step into their domain and let your will be done. Cancel out every assignment of the enemy. Rebuke the devil on every side and have your way, Father, and allow every person to walk in the center of the will that you have for them, Father. When we come, I pray that you would meet every need and whatever the need is, that you grant it. We confess our sins and acknowledge our transgressions. And Father, I, we bring our supplication before you and pray that you would work miracles. And when it's all said and done, that your name would get the glory and the honor. Your name would be exalted. I'm praying for sinners and backsliders and unchurched and unbelieving people. Praying for the saints to be strengthened and edified, that your will would be accomplished. Build a hedge around this place, Father, bind every demonic spirit. Release the anointing of God that the Holy Spirit would have free reign and do what he wants to do. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would rebuke and bind every demon in hell. And we pray for the brothers and sisters that are not in this building but are participating with us through technology. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, you can be seated. Look at your neighbor say, he coming down on the floor today. I'm about to get in, I'm about to get in y'all face, in your grill. Um, on this past Friday, I had the privilege of and the opportunity to minister to the youth of our church. I did. I went to the youth service as held every Friday. They, they are called unashamed. led by our youth pastor, the Reverend Jonathan Queen. I loved my opportunity to share with the kids, and what I want to do is find out where the, where the young people at that are here today. If you're young, let me stand up. Let me see the young people. Y'all can be seated. This is Youth Sunday, so I decided I want to talk to the youth. I want to talk to y'all. And I, I want to take off. I'm going to tell you some of what I told the youth on Friday. I want to tell the youth today. Now, I come recognizing that the reason I want to talk to youth is because I want to help them get as far down and far into the will of God for their life as they possibly can. Yeah. I have, I have a burden and a passion. It's why our church spends so many resources on youth. 
We spend more on youth and children than any other ministries in the church combined. Yeah. Because I have a passion, I have a burden for them to be, become everything God wants them to become. And I recognize, and I know some of you know, that one bad choice, one bad decision can mess up your life. Amen. One all shucks. Can mess up your life. Do I have any witnesses here today? So I want to spend these next two hours and 45 minutes talking to you. <laughs> I want to tell you what I told them. But I also recognize, here's, here's what I know. Y'all might not agree with this point, but I know it to be a fact that just because you are over 21 don't mean that you're an adult. As I tell my children all the time, you're not grown until you are paying for the roof over your head. And when you pay for the food that you eat that you put on the table, and when you buy the clothes that you're wearing, that's when you're grown. And the problem I have that I'm struggling with is there's a lot of people who are 35 and 40 and 45 years old who still don't know what they want to be when they grow up. They're still, they're still at a loss for a sense of direction, and they're still struggling with knowing what God's will is for their life. Here's one thing that's crystal clear. Everybody in here, when you, I, I, I was going to say when you were born, God had a purpose for your life, but that's not true. Before you were born, God had a purpose for you. Yeah. You, God had a purpose for your life. He knew about your life before the foundations of, this, of the world was created. And God has a purpose for your life. But some of you are still, you're 35 and 40, 45 years old, and you still don't know what your purpose is. You, don't still, you still don't know what God created you for. And it's important that you understand that your job is not your call. Your job is not your call. Your job is just to help put food on your table and a roof over your head and clothes on your back. That's what your job does. Very few people get an opportunity to get paid for what their call is. Yeah, you have a call. Everybody has a call. And my job and assignment is to try to help everybody get to that call. And the young people, I want to help you get to that call. And I want to tell you in this, this, these next, like I said, two hours and 45 minutes, what are the things that will keep you from fulfilling your call and answering your call? I want to spend time talking to you about that. I want to try to help you not get off track. And for those who are adults who still don't know what you want to be when you grow up, I want to try to show you where you got off track. And the thing that's great about the God that we serve is that he is a God, even if you got off track, he will give you another opportunity. Somebody look at your name and say, he's a God of another chance. He will give you another chance. He'll give you another opportunity to be and do and to achieve and to accomplish. He will help you become what it is God wants you to become. But I thought I would spend a few moments talking to you uh, about that. And so having said that, I want you to turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30. Somebody say Proverbs chapter 30. And um, I'm going to read verses 11 through 14. Proverbs 30, verses 11 through 14. It says, there is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation 
whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives, to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. I, if I was going to title this message, it is, There is a Generation. Say that. There is a generation. Look at your neighbor and say, There is a generation. Don't just say it like that. Have an attitude. Say, There is a generation. Now, let me kind of set the stage for this because this particular proverb, the, the book of Proverbs is generally understood to be um, written by Solomon. However, chapters 30 and 31 tells us in both the first verses of both chapters that here's a section of the scripture of the book that wasn't written by Solomon. It tells us in verse 1 that chapter 30 was written by a person. We don't know anything about him. He also tells us who he wrote it to, but we don't know anything about them either. We don't know who wrote it, no, nothing about them, know who he wrote it to. But here's what I do believe. The Spirit of God had it recorded in Scripture so that you and I would have it, and it's written to us. Somebody look at yourself, say, it's written to me. It's written to me. He wants you to understand it because it's a truth. Thing. It's a, there's some truth here that you need to get a hold of and you need to understand and you need to embrace. And he begins to tell us, now he, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I got three points. Somebody say three points. Three points. Three points. I'm going to tell you what they are. Here's for point number one. And I got sub points to point number one. I got some sub points. Here's the first point is there's, there's some problems. Somebody say there's a problem. Problem. Let me talk about the problems. It says in verse number 11 through 14, he gives us these problems. There's a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. Y'all see that, verse 11? Here's, here's the sub-point. Here's the first problem. There's a generation that is, here's my point, rebellious. There's a generation that don't want to listen to nobody. And they certainly, they, instead of listening to their parents, they curse the father and don't bless the mother. Mm. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't understand what they said. It sounded like they might have said amen. I don't know what they said back there. But there's a generation who don't listen. They think they know everything. They, they're rebellious. They kick hard and don't want to listen. And this is where problems begin when you think you know more than your parents. That's good, Pastor. I know it's good, but I'm not getting no amen from the young people. You want to know, you want to get outside of God's will? Fight against your parents. Now jot this verse down. I'm not going to turn it there, but y'all read it when you get an opportunity because I know y'all take copious notes and you go home and you reread these notes from this wonderful message I give y'all every week and you meditate on it and you ponder it. I know, I know you do that. Proverbs 21 and 1, jot this down. Proverbs 21, chapter 21, verse 1 says this. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, he turns it whithersoever or wherever he wishes. That is a profound, powerful verse. Because what it means is this. I asked the young people the question on this question. I asked them this question on Friday when I went, met with them. I read that verse to them. I asked them, what does it mean? I was surprised that they were able to communicate and tell me what it meant. Here's what it means. It means the person who is in a position of authority, God controls their heart. Mm. The king's heart, the, your parents' heart, the authority's heart, your boss's heart is in the hands of the Lord, and God controls their heart. That means has, here's what that means. That means what you should do instead of doing what you want to do, if you want to know what God's will is, one of the ways to find out what God's will is is to find out how has God directed the hearts of the people who are in authority over your life, and in particular your parents. 
Now, some of y'all have messed up because I know some of y'all are kicking back because your parents ain't saved and your parents don't know this. The scripture didn't say the king's heart, if he's saved and sanctified and Holy Ghost filled, is in the hands of the Lord. It's, no, no, no. It, just, it says the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. He turn it wherever it's will. doesn't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter whether they say, whether they can quote a Bible verse, whether they go to church, whether they've been baptized in Jesus' name in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It don't matter what, what they are. God controls their heart. And here's the power of this, because everybody, I've been preaching this all day, and here's what people come up. What if my parents weren't saved? What if they don't, what if they're not following Jesus? What if they don't go to a church? Listen, the awesomeness with the God that we serve is this. If he knows that you are living your life by this principle, he can control their heart whether they saved or not. He controls their heart. And, if, and when I got a hold of this principle in my life, I applied it in my life. I repented to my parents that I wouldn't listen to them. And God used my parents. My father didn't go. He wasn't a going to church person. He don't, my father, when he was alive, only came to church when he was here. I, I don't know. He don't, I, I don't know if he could quote a verse. I, I mean, he wasn't a religious kind of a person. But I tell you, God used that man to give order and direction to my life in an uncanny way. And I'm trying to save you the headache. By the way, young people, you think your parents is trying to ruin the fun in your life when they tell you what they're telling you they're trying to help you avoid the mistakes that they have made now I had to make a lot of decisions in my life my first decision was who was I supposed to marry and it was tough because I had hundreds of women chasing them Why, why everybody keep laughing when I say that? Huh? <laughs> so my father said he liked Trina. And I'm, I'm so glad he liked Trina. That's the woman I've been married to now for 38 years. Yeah. I remember one time I wanted to go to school. I remember I wanted to go to college before I got married. I wanted to go to college. And my parents, I had picked out this school in Michigan. I think it was Michigan. My father said I could go to any school I wanted to in Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it was in the state of Maryland. And it turned out to be the will of God for my life. I'm so glad I made that choice. That I submitted to what? God, how God directed his heart. Some of you got off track because you didn't listen to your parents. Now, the scripture says when you are a child, you obey your parents. Children obey their parents. When you are an adult, you honor your parents. When you're an adult, you don't have to obey them, but you honor them. That means you give them weight. The word honor means you give weight to what their opinion is. You, you, you don't treat them as you do some peer of yours. You give weight to them. And I'm telling you, some of you have missed the mark because you either didn't obey your parents as a child or you didn't give them honor. Somebody said, well, what if I feel one way and my parents feel another way? Well, here's what I learned. I learned I'm, I'm, I'm never going to go against my parents. Uh, if I, if I felt one way and my parents felt another way, I learned to wait until God either changed their hearts or changed my heart. Amen. And when you do that, you won't go wrong. I feel tension in the room. I could cut it with a knife right now. I'm trying to show and teach you how to live life, how to get in the perfect will of God, how to keep you from drama and pain and frustration and defeat and hell, try to keep you from going down the wrong path. Some of you are rebellious. You rebel against what God tried to say to you. Don't you know when you, when you, when you disobey your parents, it ain't your parents you're hurting, you are hurting God because God is trying to give you direction. You're, you're hurting against God. Now, as long as your parents, I'm going to go ahead. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I'm just going to go ahead with this. As long, as long, somebody say, as long, look at your neighbor. Say, as long, look at your neighbor. Where, where did I do with it? I lost my notes here. <laughs> uh, as long as they don't tell you to do something immoral, unethical, 
unscriptural or illegal, as long as they don't break any of those things, you should find out how God has directed their heart and make that your will and not, and don't you go and try to control or manipulate or change their hearts. That's another mistake some of y'all make. You try to control and manipulate and influence your parents' heart as opposed to you finding out how God has directed their hearts. Y'all ain't got to clap. Amen. That's all right. Uh, I'm just trying to help you understand how to get in God's perfect will for your life. I know everybody ain't going to accept this. Some of y'all going to get up and walk out of here and say, I don't care what the pastor said. That's fine. Go ahead. Do what you want to do. Mess up your life. My, I'm living my life. I love my life. I'm living, a, I'm living a blessed life. living a blessed life I like living this kind of life I'm living a blessed life I bless when I go and when I come I don't know the words to the song but I'm still blessed rebellious Every one of my six kids, at some juncture of their life, got to a st stage of life when they start smelling themselves. Every one of them, as well as they are. My, my, my children, I have great kids. I have my daughter, Natalie. She's my birthday baby, right here, born December 31st. Here she is, look at her, she's so pretty. <laughs> She said, please don't talk about me, but you're the only one here, so you get the opportunity to have the spotlight on you. But Natalie, for the most part, 95% of the time, she's been a wonderful child. Huh? What's the 5%? What's the 5%? That ring in her nose is that 5%. Mom, she got a ring in her nose. What is that? Okay, I'm sorry. Let me just, just let me stick with the message here. I'm not gonna put her her fit her disobedience to her father out on blast today. She's been a wonderful child for for all these years. But all of my kids at some point start smelling themselves and do something they shouldn't do. And y'all shouldn't look at me strange. Your kids did the same thing. Every last one of your kids did the same thing. Stop looking at me like. Oh no, your pet, your children, no, your kids did it too. <laughs> These church people get on my nerve acting like, acting like their kids is angels. You know your child ain't no angel. And if they haven't done it, they just kept it from you. <laughs> You just ain't discovered it yet. It's, it gonna come out. But it's okay. Everybody growing up get to a spot where you think you know more. But I'm just trying to tell you today, if you smart enough to get a hold of this word and apply it to your life, here's the point. Don't rebel against the authorities in your life. Here's the, here's the point I'm trying to make. But my thing is God is a God that will give you another chance. Amen. He'll fix it. And if you grew up and you didn't listen to your parents and you made the mistake, I'm telling you, tell God you're sorry. Tell your parents you're sorry. They might be, you might be grown now. But go back and break the curse of what you are now passing down to your children and your children. Children, children, break the curse. Break the curse. Somebody tell your neighbor, break the curse. This is why I like the 12 o'clock service. I can take my time and go as long as I want to go. That's why I told y'all it's going to be two hours and 45 minutes. Rebellion, that's number one. Here's number two. Sub point two is in verses 12 and 13. Y'all with me? This is the problem. Rebellious, rebellious is one. Rebellion is one. Here's number two, verses 12 and 13. This, there is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. 
Oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. This is a generation that are point two, sub point two, arrogant. There's a generation that thinks that they are better than other people. The, the Hebrew word for lofty means to look down on others. And I need to tell you, Prince George's Countyans, that just because you're in Prince George's County don't mean that you're better than Southeast D.C. Would you say you better than Berry Farms? No, Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. Just because you live in a nice house don't mean that you better than somebody who lives in an apartment. Amen. And, and there's a, there is a generation that's arrogant. Yes, yes. They think they've arrived. Just because you graduated from college don't make you better than somebody who didn't graduate from college. Go on and preach, Pastor. I'm doing the best that I can. The text says that they fail to see and understand that they got sin. And so they're arrogant. They, they, they're pure in their own eyes, but yet they haven't been washed from their own filthiness. They got their own issues and problems and failures, but they fail to see it. They fail to see. There's a generation that fails to see, and they're arrogant. They think they've arrived. They got it all together. They're lofty in their own eyes. Their eyelids are lifted up. They're looking. Their noses up in the air. They're looking down on other people. But I'm here to try to tell you, don't be, don't be arrogant. Matter of fact, there but by the grace of God go you. Amen. So arrogance, God hates arrogance. God resists the proud, James 4 says. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He opposes the plans of the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God loves humility. And you know what humility means? Humility means I recognize that I need God in my life. That without God in my life, I'm nothing. Without God in my life, I'm a failure. Without Christ ordering my steps, I'm defeated. If I don't have Christ in my life, I'm tore up from the floor up. I'm broke up. I'm messed up. I'm jacked up. But because of the grace of God, I am who I am. And I am where I am because of his grace. Amen. Then there's a... There's rebellious, there's a generation that's arrogant, and then there's a generation, verse 14. Can I read verse 14? Let me tell you what it means. Here's point, sub point three underneath of this, point one, uh, or letter C, whatever you want to call it, is there's a generation that is selfish. Somebody say selfish. Verse 14, look at verse 14. Whose teeth are like swords, and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. When it talks about their teeth are like swords and their fangs are like knives, here's what that means. It means they are devouring all of the resources available to themselves on themselves. And we live in a generation and a culture of people where everything is about them. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them everything ain't about you. It ain't all about you. I know you don't want to hear this, but it ain't all about you. But we live in a generation that spends and consumes everything available to them on me, myself, and I. Woo! You know, let me tell you something. I'm almost finished with my introduction. Our forefathers, our foreparents did so much more with so much less. Yeah. 
They, they built colleges and universities and they put their kids through school. They did great things with so much less. But now we got much more, but we're doing so much less. We got so much more, but we're spending it on ourselves. They put their kids through college. They did what they had to do. They, they, they sacrificed. That's, what, that's a word we don't have. We don't sacrifice. We consume it on ourselves. Y'all buying fancy cars to lean around and impress people who don't even like you. Y'all ain't got to say nothing to me. Y'all got fancy clothes, y'all got big purses, y'all got shiny shoes, and you're wasting money while your kids are picking up debt to get through college, and here you are spending all of that money on yourself when you ought to be concerned about your children helping the next generation. That's what godly people do. They take what's available and help their children and grandchildren. That's what we ought to be doing, helping our kids go to school, get out of the ghetto, get out of the hood, and be able to take care of themselves. I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to get my kids through college and get them graduate. I got five of my six kids through college, and I want to get them through college and out my house. Come on, somebody, say amen. Don't come back. Amen. But I made sacrifices. And every one of my kids graduated from school without college debt. Yeah. But y'all are spending your money on stuff, new cars and fancy clothes and on yourself with no regard, and that's selfish. I'm trying to let that sink in for a few minutes. We can't be selfish. Matter of fact, the scripture says not only are they, their, their teeth like swords and their fangs like knives, chewing and consuming everything for themselves, it also says they don't care about the poor. They're unconcerned about helping the needy. And the truth of the matter is, I'm almost finished. I'm bringing my plane in for a landing. I'm, coming, I'm bringing my boat into the dock. I'm pulling my car into the garage. I'm putting my dishes in the dishwasher. <laughs> we have no concern about the less fortunate. You know what the scripture says? He who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. All right, let me close. Here's my second point. There's a penalty. Here's point two, penalty. Somebody say, there's a penalty. Y'all see, I got the first point was what? A problem. Point two, go ahead with your peas, Pastor. Say, go ahead with your peas. I am peeing today. Peas. Slide down to verse 17. Y'all see verse 17? It says, The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother. That word mock means make fun of. And scorns obedience, rejects being obedient to their mother. It goes back even to the first verses we were talking about. It's all about rejecting. It's all about being rebellious. And the penalty is this. The eyes will be picked out by ravens. Now what does that mean? Listen here. Let me try to explain this to you. A raven is a scavenger. They eat dead things. When the raven sees something that they think is dead, it, it makes sure it's dead by plucking at its eye. It starts picking at the eye. And if, if you pluck at somebody's eye, they don't move, they dead. They pluck at the eye, it's moving, they know it's not dead. And, and here's what happens. 
you lose your sense of direction. And the, even the, the, the ravens pluck out your eyes uh, and comes and get, it makes you lose your sense of direction. And here's what happens. You don't know which way to go. You, you're losing your sense of direction, so you're, you're not moving, so it looks like you're dead. You're not making progress in life. You're not moving forward. You're not getting into the thing God wanted you to get in. So you look dead. So he comes and starts picking at your eye. And while he's picking at your eye, you know what that means? That means he's trying to see if you're alive or dead. But since you don't know where to go or what to do, he's able to go ahead and pluck your eye out because, and you lose your sense of direction. We got a lot of people today who are 35 and 40 and 45 years old who still don't know what they want to be when they grow up. They don't know what they want to do. They don't know why God created them. God created everybody here for something. But the reason you've lost your sense of direction, the reason you don't know what to do with your life is because the scripture is clear. You have mocked your father and you have scorned to be obedient to your mother. God tried to give you a sense of direction, but you thought you knew everything. And I'm here to tell young people, I'm trying to tell the young people today, don't let the enemy deceive you and get you off track. Listen to your parents. Listen to your parents. Listen to your parents. It's going to keep you in the safe journey. Walk you down the path God wants you to. As if you don't, the ravens will pluck out your eyes. You will never get a sense of direction. You're going to be growing up 50 years old, don't know what you're supposed to be doing in your life. You will have no sense of direction, no sense of knowing what God's call is on your life because you can't see. Now, I need to tell some people, if you done messed up in this area, God is a God that will give you an opportunity to repent. Somebody say, I need a second chance. Somebody say, I need a second chance. Jot this verse down. Don't have time to read it. Verse Proverbs 20, 20. Jot it down, because I know y'all going to go and read it when you get an opportunity, because y'all, as soon as you get home, you're going to go home and dive into it, because I know y'all take these scriptures like I said earlier you take the, the you take good notes and you go home and you reread it and you meditate on it and you ponder it and you apply it to your life and you 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 muddle over it all week long <laughs> Proverbs 20 20 talks about that if you curse your mother and father your lamp will be put out and you will be in deep darkness Curse your mother and father, your father and mother, your lamp will be put out and you'll be in deep darkness. You don't know what to do. I'm just trying to tell you, stop cursing your parents. Try to find out how God has inclined their heart. And you'll be in the center of God's will for your life. So many decisions I had to make in life and I consulted my parents. I remember one time we wanted to buy a house and we, we saw this house we wanted. My wife and I wanted this house and I called my father. He was living in South Carolina at the time. He drove all the way up and looked at the house, said, amen, go for it. And so uh, we put an offer on the house. He got in the car, drove back home, eight hours. By the time he got home, he had changed his mind. Uh, well. So he gets back to South Carolina and calls us back and says, I changed my mind. I said, Dad, we've already made an offer on the house. We already put a, we already put a contract on the house. We've made an offer. And so we prayed, and the people didn't accept the house. Yeah. They didn't accept the offer on me. I said they didn't accept the house. <laughs> they didn't accept the offer on the house. And so we were able to get out of that deal and we turned around and uh, just a couple weeks later, a much better deal came along, which is the house that we've now been living in for the past 20 years. It all comes from us listening to our parents and believing the scriptures because God controls the heart of the authorities in your life. It's a principle. I'm trying to get y'all to get this principle in your life. Don't think that you are, you are winning when you disregard the authorities God put in your life. You know what I discovered? I discovered that the people who can't listen to their pastor don't listen to their parents either. I want to spend a few moments right there for just a little bit. Yeah. If you can't learn how to respect authority at home, you ain't going to learn how to respect authority in, in church or, or on your job. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, please wake up before the pastor come and wake you up, please. 
you saved him. <laughs> I was coming to wake him up. He was, he looked like he was snoring, but it's okay. I'm up. You up now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me close with this. Here's my third and final point. I'm done. I'm going to let y'all go. Potential. The thing is, God gives us potential. And I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Can I read that to y'all? Good. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Young people, listen to this. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Here's the potential. Here's what God is saying. There is a generation that rebels. There is a generation that's arrogant. There is a generation that is selfish. There is a generation that will lose their way. Their eyes will be plucked out. However, there is a generation that are blood washed and spirit filled and word taught and world changes. There are some young people sold out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There are some young people who are committed to the things of God and I'm so happy and so proud that we got a bunch of them right here at the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. They keep talking about the young people and how bad they are and how disrespectful they are and how they don't listen. But I got great news. We got some young people here who are sold out for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm going to close with this. Amen. When I went to the young people on Friday, they sent me and showed me a video that they created for their ministry. They're called, the name of our youth ministry is Unashamed. And they did a video that's their Unashamed Anthem. And I was so excited about it, I told them I was gonna show it to y'all. Watch this. We don't just say we are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, we live unashamed lives. We listen more than we preach. We learn more than we teach. We give more than we receive, and we serve more than we lead. We love God. We love each other. We win souls and make disciples so that Jesus gets the fame. We are unashamed.
I want you to know how much I appreciate you encouraging our young people. That's an that's a encouragement to me. I, I saw some of y'all, you didn't budge, you didn't clap, you didn't smile. But you know what? The drug dealers will make them feel appreciated. We should be a church, and we are a church, that thanks God for young people who are sold out for the kingdom of God. Their, their theme, their, their name came from Romans 1.16. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That means when you put your faith in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, it has the power to change your life. And you, you know what's so powerful about it? No matter what you've done in your past, God will forgive you. That's the power of the gospel. He will wash your slate clean. And some of you here today, you've done some wrong. If you were to die today, you would break the gates of hell wide open. But I got great news for you. Jesus has made provisions that you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. And if you want to go to heaven, get on up and come down here. We can show you how to get to go to heaven right now. If you're not sure, come right now. Amen. Jeff came. There's one person. Somebody else come right now. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Unsaved, backslidden, you want to rededicate? Come right now. Come this very moment, this very instant. Come now. You need a church home? Come right now. That's right. Come.